If you have your Bibles tonight, I'm sure that you do, turn to Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17. We have been, we began our, uh, our new Bible class quarter last Sunday morning. I wasn't here Sunday morning, uh, unfortunately, but uh, we began our Bible class quarter in the adult class then on Wednesday night and began a study of the, the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And as we started that study, we went back to grasp a little context and went back to the book of Acts in Acts chapter 18. We're in 17 tonight. In 18, Paul travels to the city of Corinth. And in Acts chapter 18, he establishes uh, the church there in that city of Corinth. And as we've kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, talked about that a couple of times now, Wednesday night and then this morning, Sunday morning, we're, we're going through those books on, on both of our, our class times during the week. As we've talked about that, we have ended up in Acts chapter 18 a couple of times, sort of reviewing what happened and some of the, the people involved. But we have reminded ourselves um, both Wednesday and Sunday that just before that, before Paul ends up in Corinth, he is in the city of Athens. And we're familiar with Athens, more familiar than we are with Corinth today. Um, and we remember that what Paul does in Athens is he stands at the Areopagus or at Mars Hill, depending on what translation you have, and he preaches a gospel sermon to a bunch of men who do not yet know the gospel. And as I've talked about it a couple of times, I started thinking about that a little more. And I have given this some thought in the past, and I, I thought we should talk about it. I had another idea for a sermon tonight, but I, I went back to this idea because I think what Paul does in Acts chapter 17 is that he not just teaches us, but he gives us a wonderful example of how we can preach and teach the gospel to those who've never heard the gospel. As Christians, we know we are commanded to share the gospel, to preach and teach the good news of God's saving grace. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mark chapter 16, 15, and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and has been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved or does not believe shall be condemned. And we know that's an obligation. That's a commandment that Christ gave to His closest disciples. But it is a commandment as we look at the pattern of the church and we look at other passages in the text. It's a commandment and an obligation that all of us have even today. That's what we're trying to do as Christians. But it's not easy. Some people are naturals at uh, sharing the gospel with others, not just in the way they live, but uh, I've always been envious uh, a bit of people who have, you know, kind of no fear and a, and a unique ability of starting a conversation and, and having that conversation end up talking about salvation and baptism and, and those things seem to come so natural for some and not so natural maybe for the rest of us. We're all trying to share that gospel. We should be, if for no other reason, because someone shared that gospel with us. We heard the good news of God's saving grace. We believed it. We obeyed it. It changed our lives. It, it changed our eternity. And because it did, we are effectively, or looking for effective ways, I should say, to share that message with as many people as we can. I think sometimes we become uh, a little indifferent or content, at least in action, uh, in not sharing the gospel as often as we should. You know, we think, well, it's just not in my wheelhouse or I don't have as many opportunities as oh, I really should do it, but I haven't gotten around to it. But we should. We should be actively trying to do that. And so if we ask ourselves, well, how? How is that done? Perhaps we can consider the example of Paul in Acts chapter 17 because it's exactly what Paul has done. He's found a group of strangers who do not yet know the gospel and he starts a conversation and shares the gospel and is successful. Not everyone who hears him speak believes or becomes a believer, but some do. And we'll see that tonight. In Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul has a little bit of a layover in Athens, Greece. He's traveling now and he's going to end up, as we said, in Corinth. But he's in Athens waiting for Timothy and Silas. And in, 
Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, <clears throat> excuse me, the text says, Now while, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing a city full of idols. Now I want to be clear, this, I don't believe this is any uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit that is you know, moved inside of Paul. All it's describing is Paul sitting there in this city that is overflowing with idols, and he can't help himself. He, he's getting excited about having a conversation. He knows he has to say something, whether or not he yet knows what he's going to say. He, he's not willing to be indifferent. He, he's motivated. Uh, he's provoked uh, to do something about it. Provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. So he's so motivated by what he sees around him, all of these idols, which think about how that might motivate someone like Paul, that he's going to the synagogue and he's speaking to Jewish people. He's going to the synagogue and speaking to, uh, you know, converts to Judaism, Greek believers. He's going to the marketplace every day. He's not just standing on a corner screaming, preaching, but he is reasoning with people about the gospel. Verse 18 tells us he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, uh, even preaching in a way that even the Greek philosophers are curious about what Paul is saying. And so they take Paul to the Areopagus, again, Mars Hill, which is this stone outcropping in Greece. It's still there. You can Google it and you can see a wonderful picture of it. And then you can see the whole lay of the land. It's where Paul stood. We know, you know, within several feet of exactly where he was. And this is a spot where the uh, educated men of the day, the philosophers, the guys that sat around and just talked about stuff, would come and gather and they would talk about philosophy and they would talk about new ideas and they would, of course, talk about religion. In verse 20, the text says, uh, or they say to Paul, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. And so they hear Paul reasoning in the marketplace and they gather him up and they bring him to the Areopagus and they want to hear more about what he says. And, and they say, tell us more. And now Paul has the opportunity to do exactly what we want to do. He has the opportunity to preach the gospel. He's got a group of people, educated people, who are somewhat religious minded, who are asking for Paul to explain this gospel. Again, they are unbelievers. There is not a single Christian in the crowd. And standing before you like tonight in a room that is filled with people who have already obeyed the Gospels, that is one thing. We might get nervous doing that just because we're standing up. We don't want to make a mistake. We know how important these topics are. But Paul standing in front of a crowd of highly educated non-believers. And that's got to be something totally different. And so how is Paul going to do this? What is Paul going, uh, going to do? How is he going to begin? And he begins, number one, he begins with a compliment, somewhat of a compliment. Uh, he certainly doesn't begin with an insult, but he begins by finding some common ground. And we might sometimes be opposed to that, or some might as they share the gospel, but I think it's a very good technique. He has this crowd of people. They really have very little in common, but Paul finds something that they do share, uh, a respectful kindness, we might say. Look at verse 22. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. That's a compliment. He says, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription, quote, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Notice what Paul did not do. Paul didn't get up and say, you bunch of morons have these idols everywhere. You fools have no idea what you're doing. That's not how he started. It is very complimentary. I have observed that you are religious in all respects. I was walking through the city. I took an interest in your religion, in the things that you believe. He, he knows they believe these things sincerely. Uh, he says uh, 
He saw this altar to an unknown God, and then he says, let me tell you about who that God is. And I think if you're those philosophers sitting there waiting to hear something new, and Paul says, let me tell you this, the the altar I saw to an unknown God, you think, well, he really does know something about us. I used to sit in, in meetings all the time. People would come to sell us stuff in the restaurant business, and you could tell, as you all are familiar, I'm sure, you could tell so quickly if they had no idea what we actually did in our business. Or they would act as if they were experts, but they really had no idea what they were talking about. Well, these guys aren't any different. And Paul says, look, I've taken the time to think about what you believe. And one of the things I noticed was this unknown God. Let me tell you about who that really is. That would have piqued their curiosity. Athens was an extraordinarily religious city, not Christian by any means, but it's estimated that there were 30,000 idols in the city. They would have just lined the temples and lined the buildings. They would have been everywhere that you turned. And even still, as religious as they are, as thoughtful as these people are, they fear, this is how sincere they are, they fear that even with 30,000 different idols, they fear that they have missed even just one. And so Paul says, incredible uh, intelligence level here. Paul says, let me tell you about that one that you think you might have missed. Let me tell you about the God that you do not yet know. And then he answers their questions. He begins with that compliment. He begins by finding that common ground. And we know the church is made up of all kinds of people. John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, uh, for God so loved the world. It's not just, you know, a certain nationality of people or a certain gender of people. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, go into all the world. It is, it is applicable. It is available to everyone. Paul is opening this up to the world. It's not just Jewish people. It's not just God-fearing Greeks. And he finds a question that they have. And he prepares to answer that question. And as he does, he teaches them the gospel. And here's how he does that. Next, he tells them that God, the God you do not yet know, the God who is unknown to you, he tells them that God has made the world and everything that's in it. He tells them that God is great. He tells them that God is powerful than that, but more than just powerful, but more than just powerful, he tells them that God is all powerful. Look at verse 24 of 17. He says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now, these guys don't even know there is such a God. They don't know anything about this. Again, Paul surely is piquing their interest. He is in a city surrounded by idols and statues. And he's telling them God is active. He doesn't dwell or sit in temples that are made with hands. As Paul would have said these words, the Parthenon. We're familiar, I think, with the Parthenon. You can see the the recreation of the Parthenon in Nashville. But the Parthenon would still be standing. It it would have been the place where uh, the goddess Athenia, who was the goddess of Athens, this giant statue would have been right there. The Parthenon would have surely been in view, even as Paul said these words, just four or five hundred yards away, glistening in the sun. And he says, God that you don't know isn't confined to some temple, not even a temple as grand as this. Now, I'm paraphrasing, I'm adding a little bit here, but perhaps that's how he gestured. He is more powerful He is greater than any of these. Your unknown God is the God who made the world. He is the God of the heavens and the earth. He is the God of the entire world and everything that is in it. He goes on to say that he is so powerful that he even created mankind. In verse uh, 25, he says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Paul says he is the provider of everything that we know. He gave us even the breath in our lungs. That means he gave us our life. He is not served by human hands. He doesn't need anyone to bring him food or to bring him gifts, which would have been very common practice among these idols. They would have, you know, on certain days or days of the week or days of the year, different holidays surrounding these idols, they would have brought gifts and flowers. And we've seen some of those depictions even on the news and in parts of our world even today. 
There was no need uh, from God for any of those things. That's, that's not this sort of God. There is no need for you to dust him off or to polish him. Maybe, you know, as he spoke these words, they were shining up uh, uh, some idol that was just over the horizon. He says he is the God of every nation. He give, gave life to all the people. This isn't just the God of Israel. Maybe they had heard about him, but that's all they knew. He's not confined, though, to some country or some city or some temple as these uh, idols are all around them. He is all powerful. He is omnipotent. He is everywhere all the time. He is omnipresent. Paul tells him as he begins his sermon, he's found that common ground. Then he says, let me tell you about the God that is powerful. And then he tells them that God wants you to seek him and he wants you to find him. He wants you to seek him and he wants you to find him. That God doesn't need to be, doesn't want to be an unknown God. And Paul's making this connection. I saw the unknown God. Well, let me tell you about him. He's more powerful than you can imagine. And not only is he powerful, but he wants you to find out who he is and he wants you to find it now. He wants you to seek him. He wants you to find him. They're already looking for this God, right? They have a statue dedicated to wondering who it could be. Paul says, I have the answer. Again, surely it piques their interest. In verse 26, he says, and he made from one man, that's Adam, from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. What Paul says is this God, the one I'm talking about, the one I'm telling you about, the one I'm revealing to you now, this God has always been at work in the world. In verse 27, that they would seek God, that men would seek God of every nation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God has always been involved in the lives of men. He has, from just one man, created every nation so that they would seek Him. That's what He desires. That's what He wants from men. God has worked in men's lives so that they would see Him working in their lives. That they would trust Him. That they would say, I want to know more about Him. That I want to belong to Him. I want to obey Him. So that they would recognize the power that He has. So that they would recognize the authority that he has. He wants men to seek after him if they choose to, as as the text says, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. God doesn't force anyone to serve him. Certainly not in the Christian age. We're not forced to be a Christian. It's a requirement of salvation. But God leaves that decision up to us. He has never chosen who was going to serve him or who would be saved and who would be lost. That's not what God has done. He has always desired that all men would come to him. Paul says, if you're sincere in seeking him and finding him, he will no longer be, quote, an unknown God because God is not that far hard to find. He says at the end of that that verse there, he is not far from each one of us. He's right here in our presence. It's not hard to find him. It is not a great mystery of who this creator is. It shouldn't be this difficult. Romans chapter one and verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, his speaking of God, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And that verse is so powerful. It tells us that anybody can walk out of this building and look at the flowers and look at the trees and look at the clouds, see the stars in the sky, the moon, the sun and the day, and they can know that there is a greater power. His invisible attributes, his his eternal power, his divine nature has clearly been seen. It has always been seen so clearly that we are, that all men are truly Without excuse, sincere seekers will find God. Psalm 19 and verse one says the heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Sometimes I think of the Psalms and I I think of people who would, you know, post the Psalms are, you know, believers of God and they just use those things as praise. But the Psalms reveal the truth of God's nature. The evidence of God is literally all around us. And then Paul says, 
And you already know he exists. You already know he exists. Look at verse 28. He says, being then children of God, and he's talking to them and everybody, being then children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. He says, you yourselves know that God exists. You already know that God exists. Um, I skipped a verse, verse 28. He says, back up to verse 28. He says, for in him we live and move and exist as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Again, now back up. He says, you know that God exists. You philosophers know, even your own poets, the Greek poets have written something about God. They have said, for we also are his children. They have acknowledged, even in their own culture, that something clearly more powerful than them exists. Something greater than us exists. And they have even described it in their own culture as children to a father. Which acknowledges we must have come from him. We came from something. We came from some creator. Something has made us. And so Paul says, you've already acknowledged that something is the creator. Sure, you've got all mixed up along the way. And now you have these 30,000 idols. But you know there's something that's so powerful as to give life. Therefore, Paul says, you and I recognize that he has a divine nature. You know that there is a creator. Therefore, you know he has this nature that is all his own. Again, verse 29, being the children of God, we recognize that's what we are. Being the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Paul says, if we are like children to a father, we are acknowledging, recognizing, admitting that he is not like us. If we recognize that he's not like gold, he's not like silver, he's not like stone, he isn't something that's been made with our hands, he is far greater than any of those things could ever be. Nothing made of stone could, could give you know, life, breathe, put breath in our lungs. And what Paul is doing is very politely and very logically pointing out to these men that what they are trying to do doesn't make any sense. Again, he didn't show up and say, you bunch of morons, you've missed the point completely. Let me punch you in the face of the gospel. He's gone through all of these steps to, again, very logically and politely point out that very thing, though. What you're doing makes no sense at all. If you recognize that there is a creator of the world, a being that is so powerful that it is able to create, you also need to recognize that there is not a statue that could ever be created that could be that God. It makes no sense. No matter how shiny, no matter how tall, no matter how impressive that statue is, it is always inferior to man. Isaiah chapter 44, a passage we're familiar with, verse 12. The Bible says, "...the man shapes in iron into a cutting tool." And does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in a house." Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and then the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it burns in the fire over this half uh, he eats meat and he roasts the roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I am worn. I have seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god. His graven image, he falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has uh, smeared over their eyes 
so that they cannot see in their hearts, so that they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there any knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire and also have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it, and then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. If you know there's a creator, which you do, you've already acknowledged that. If you know there is something so powerful to be the creator, then there is no statue that could ever be that creator. Paul is saying that the God that you do not know is the one that created the world, is the one that you need to find, and he is not a statue. God is powerful. He cannot be confined to a temple. Uh, a temple that's made with human hands. God wants you to seek Him. When you seek Him, you will find Him. And again, you yourselves already know that. Then Paul says, that God, as powerful as He is, commands repentance. He requires you to repent. Look at verse 30 of Acts chapter 17. He says, therefore, having said all of that, Paul says, now that I've walked you down this path, therefore, Having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. For generations, God has put up with, has, um, has allowed men to live through ignorance. For generations, God has put up with man's ignorance, with man's sin, even though God hates sin. And God did that because Christ had not yet come. God had this plan from the moment that man sinned in the garden, maybe a plan that was, you know, hatched even before that. But once they sinned in the garden, uh, that plan went into action. And until Christ came, God has, as the text says, overlooked that sin. And that can be a little difficult for us to understand or, or wrap our minds around. But at this point, what Paul is saying is the Messiah has now come. We know his blood has now been shed on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven. God has in some ways delayed his justice. He has he has put that off. He has overlooked sin. He hasn't condoned it, but he has allowed those things to carry on. Looked past man's sin toward the coming of the Messiah. The King James Version here in Acts chapter 17 says that God winked at sin. And that is not a great translation. Maybe it's just antiquated. It's it's old. Maybe it's just not accurate. But it gives this sense to me that God, and it's become part of our culture, that God saw people sinning and he kind of just said, I got you, you're good. That's not what it means at all. God has overlooked it. God has looked toward the future. He's never approved of sin in any way, but he has always looked toward the cross. And now God's plan is complete. And now, even as Paul stands before these men, God requires repentance of these men. He requires repentance of us. Repentance of sin is obedience to God. It is commanded of all people everywhere, Paul says. In writing to the Thessalonian Christians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul describes it. He says how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Even you grew up serving idols, worshiping idols. You have turned away from those idols. You have turned to God. You have repented of that sin. What Paul says to these men is stop worshiping these false gods. Stop worshiping these idols. And then he tells them why. He tells them that God will one day judge the world. Look at verse 31. Because, okay, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul says judgment day is coming. God's judgment is coming. It will come on a day that has already been fixed. The date and the time has already been set. God knows when judgment is going to happen. He knows that we know that his judgment is going to be righteous. We know that his judgment is going to be through Christ. It is Christ who was raised from the dead. 
It is uh, Christ who is raised from the dead. And, and that fact is included in every single sermon we find in the book of Acts because his resurrection is the gospel itself. It is the hope of salvation that Christ overcame both sin and death, that we don't simply have to decompose in some grave somewhere uh, for all of eternity, but that you and I can look forward to being raised up from the grave, just like Christ was raised from the grave, as we often say from Romans chapter six, to walk in a newness of life, to spend eternity with God, with this God, if Paul's on that hill that day, the God that you do not yet know. Romans chapter two and verse 16 says, we will be judged by the gospel through Jesus Christ. It affirms exactly what Paul is saying here. It will be a righteous judgment because God is righteous. Everything about him is good and perfect and right and just. Christ is able to sit as a judge of mankind because he lived both as God and in the flesh. He was tempted in all ways just as we are yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. And so that is Paul's sermon to these men of Athens. And as he finishes that sermon, the text tells us that some sneered at this idea of a resurrection. You know, maybe wag their hand as we would today. But some believed and some joined Paul. And then Paul traveled on to Corinth and we pick up our Bible class uh, again on Wednesday night. The sermon that Paul preached, though, one is a good example for us, I think, as we interact with people and try to share the gospel. But it's also a sermon that applies to each one of us. Paul delivered a wonderful sermon and we can steal a little bit of that sermon tonight. All of us here, like these men, all of us here are certainly religious people. If you've never obeyed the gospel, if you're not yet a Christian, maybe you're still searching for God or searching for answers. But all of us here believe in God. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? There are other things we could be doing tonight. All of us here desire to know more about God. Otherwise, again, we wouldn't be here tonight. The God that you and I seek to worship, if we're Christians or if we've not yet become a Christian, the God we seek to worship cannot be confined to a temple that has been made with human hands. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. He is the God of the heavens and the earth. He is the God who gave us life and gave us breath, who has worked since before the very foundations of the world through the lives of men to ensure a way by which you and I and everyone else can have our sins forgiven. He went as far even to send his own son to die on the cross. You and I can look around the world, just as Paul makes clear, we can look around the world and see that, that there must be a power far greater than us. There must be some creator. That's the God that we're talking about. He is a God that if we continue down this path, he commands our repentance. We have everything that we need to know in order to serve him, in order to obey him. If we don't know how to serve him, if we don't know how to obey him, we can search the scriptures. We can talk to other Christians. We can desire and seek to know more. We can study and we can learn. And we need to do that because the day is coming. A day when that we do not know. A day when uh, he will come at an hour when we do not think he will. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22. That day which is judgment day. When we will be judged by our Father in heaven, the creator of the world and everything in it, so powerful, the one who sent his son to die, the perfect and righteous God, when we will be judged by Christ himself, the one who came down from heaven and gave his life for us, who, who lived and died in the flesh, who was tempted in all ways just as we are, yet never with one single sin, who was raised from the grave, that day is coming. And Paul didn't say these words, but the question we would ask ourselves tonight is, are we ready for that day to come? Are you here tonight and still searching for that God? Or do you know him? Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Have you repented of sin? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you done what he has commanded? Are you still striving to please someone or something other than God? Or have you given everything over to him? If you're here tonight and you've not obeyed the gospel, the Bible teaches that when a person hears the word of God, when they believe it, when they are willing to obey it by repenting of sin in their life and confessing the name of Jesus before men, that person can go down into the waters of baptism and in that moment have their sins washed away. In that moment, they become a child of God. They become a Christian. They're added to the body of Christ. They become a member uh, of the church, added to the 
uh, by the Lord himself. If you haven't done that, we'd invite you to make that decision. Maybe you have been baptized. I know most of us here have, but perhaps you have sin in your life. Maybe it's sin that only you know about, but it's a sin that you have not yet repented of, a sin maybe that you struggled with for years that separates you from God. Don't leave this place. Don't leave this moment carrying that burden of sin and separation. Repent of that sin. Pray to God to forgive you, and He will. And if you need the prayers of this church, let us pray with you and let us pray for you. If you have those or any other need, we hope you'll make it known. Come forward now while we stand and while we sing this invitation song.